Hello. Hello, hello. 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 One second. Hi, everyone. Just getting everything together. Welcome. We will be bringing on Angela White very shortly. I'm super excited to talk to her. Come on in, everyone. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I'm just pinning this comment right now, and then we'll get right into our special special show we have for for you today okay hey it's taking a long time to type <laughs> all right there we go i just want you guys to know what we're doing right now we'll be bringing in our special guest her name is angela white she's amazing she's done there we go. She's done some amazing things. And we're going to talk all about it. Hey. How are y'all feeling during this quarantine? Are you still... Shout out your city. Shout out where you from so I can know where you guys are checking in from. I'm in LA. And I'm your host in this conversation piece. You are watching... Girls on the Grind TV. We're going to do a little girl talk with my guest today. Her name is Angela White, and she is a powerhouse producer, author, uh, business strategist. She does it all. She is a motivational speaker. She's going to tell us all about everything that she has her hand in. And not only that, she has um, some projects where she gives back. And I think that's super important for people to do. Um, so we're gonna bring her on and before I do bring her on I just want to tell you guys about girls on the grind if you do not know so girls on the grind is my passion project where I want to give women a voice and a platform and recognition for doing amazing jobs when they may or may not be getting that recognition as well as inspire other people to follow their dreams in no matter what it is they want to do or whatever they're passionate about, let them know that they can do it. So that's what Girls on the Grind is about. And this is why I want to bring on different women so that you can hear about their stories and how they overcome things because it's not easy, but it's worth it. Trust me. So we're going to bring her in. Yes. I think I have a question too. Welcome, Hi. welcome. We How have are you this conversation guest, piece? <laughs> guest of the hour, Miss Angela White. Hi. She is from New Jersey, living in LA for the last 20 years and has been producing some amazing films, you know? Absolutely. And she has, you know, over 35 credits on IMDb of her work. And I was just super impressed with everything that she has going on, as well as your endeavors of giving back to the community and to other filmmakers and people who want to be involved in entertainment. So I thought that was very uh, impressive. So how are you doing? I'm good. Can you hear me well? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. I wish it could be in person, but eventually social, social distancing, <laughs> right. this is how we have to do it now. <laughs> eventually. Eventually. Yeah, for sure. So, um, I just want to know because this is all about inspiring other women. Yeah. What inspires you to grind? You know, first and foremost is being a woman and breaking barriers. Very important. A lot of women, you know, we going back to the 30s, 40s, and 50s were not afforded certain opportunities to compete with our counterparts, a male, right? So just being a woman, we need to be grinding every day for the next woman. So we have to understand that. So from a historical perspective, I know I have to grind, just like being a woman of color. I know I have to grind. There's too many people who have died. There's too many people who have gone through too many struggles for us to be in this position now to do what we do. Right, right. So 
what are some of the jobs that you had to do to get to where you are now that may have been considered like a hard job or a job where you were just like, I don't know, I don't want to do this for the rest of my life. Like what led you up into this point? Yeah, you know, when I first started out in the business uh, or just in life, you know, you always have this job, whether it was, I was a paper girl at one time, which people probably find that hard to believe, but I, that was where I learned money. So my mom made me be a paper girl like 11 or 12 until I was about 16. And I was really good at just delivering papers and collecting the money. And I was really good at Girl Scout cookies, selling them. So then I went from there one time to being a cashier. And then, you know, when you're in college, you're taking all kinds of end jobs just to make it. And then even finally, when I was at a record company, I was really more like an assistant, like a runner. And that's when I knew, oh, there's more for me than this. And that's what yeah. I started pushing for my education. But I've done a little bit of everything. So were some, some things that you learned from taking on all those jobs that mm -hmm. it still helped you in the long run, even though it may not have been your end game, but it still was a stepping stone for you? Absolutely. You know, I tell people all the time, it's good to work for other people. Because one, you learn what you want to do and what you will not do, right? And then number two is good to start at a humble place because you have so only place you have to go is what up right yeah, yeah. so to me to start at the bottom is amazing because you get to see up and you know there's a lot more for you so every job i've done it reminds me too that jobs come and go you know i've worked so many jobs over the last 25 years so they come and go so even if i lose my job i'm not as nervous like i can't get another job right it's like i'm like okay i know how to hustle I could do a little bit of everything. I'm going to always work. Right. Always. And this, and this <laughs> led you to, to where you are today. You were the first African-American woman mm -hmm. to produce a faith-based film. Theatrical film. Yeah, for it to come out in theater. So you're, you're breaking down barriers. Like, it's crazy in 2020. We're still doing the first mm -hmm. of whatever. And so tell me about, like, that... It, and what made you do that? Were, were you seeking that or did it just happen? No, so it happened in 2017. So what happened is we were promoting the film. It was coming out in theaters, A Question of Faith. And one of the publicists on the team was like, you know, you're the first uh, African-American woman. And she was not African-American to put out a theatrical base film, especially at the uh, African-American Women Production Company. A lot of people don't realize, even though a lot of people historically who are of color, we are Christians, but it doesn't mean we put out a lot of faith-based content in theaters. So I didn't even have a clue. And then we researched it, the studio researched it and found out it was true. But this was after we already did the film. I, I don't go into film for glory. It, it doesn't work that way. A lot of times glory comes out the work you do. And that's the great thing about God, not to you know pivot a little bit, but when you do good work, things come out of it that you least expected. And I had no idea about that. Yeah, and when I was looking you up, you were saying that your legacy is what's important to you, not as far as like the glitz and glam, even though you are working with celebrities and making films. So tell me what exactly you want your legacy to be. I think that at the most part, you always want people to think of you in a way that may change, right? Whether they liked you or they didn't like you, you want to make sure you're, at least for me, my impact is, okay, she made more of a difference than not a difference in this world. And that's what's important. So it can't just be, uh, oh, I know this celebrity. Oh, I know this person. They're, they're not going to make an impact for me. The impact starts with us. And as long as if I leave this world and I know I've made some difference, even being opening doors, uh, hiring people, giving people opportunities who normally wouldn't, that's the impact I want to leave behind. And what are some of the stories you want to tell? Or is it more as you being a producer, do people bring you stories and you kind of build um, on their creative, you know, ideas as far as the, the script or the story? Or are you coming up with all of that development as well? Well, a lot of times people bring the ideas or I'm just hired. I'm a hired gun. It's not even my story to tell. The only stories I want to tell have Silver Lining Entertainment behind it. So if my production company didn't produce it, then I'm a gun for hire. So when I'm a gun for hire, then I'm telling other people's stories. But when my company looks for it, like A Question of Faith was a, a Silver Lining Entertainment production, 
I'm telling stories that have impact, that have changed, that are going to make people feel, make people resonate. I just did a project in Atlanta in November called Hands Up. That's going to be one of my best projects to date. That's talking about what's happening right now. Young mm -hmm. Black men with their hands up and they're being killed. So I want to tell stories that are going to draw some type of emotion out of you. And everybody's not going to tell those stories. And a lot of times I like working on other people's stories because I have to learn how to work with everybody, too. I can't only tell my stories. I have to tell really everybody's stories. Yeah. Would you ever consider maybe working with some of the families? I don't know if they would be okay with it being a, a film where you kind of tell the story of like, so we can know because a lot of times these victims are criminalized. They're, oh, at 12 mm -hmm. years old, they stole a candy bar. And it's like, right. he doesn't deserve to die. So we want to know who was Trayvon Martin before he, you know, was hunted down that day? Who was a mob operator? Like, right. would you be able to, you know, maybe consider doing something like that? Absolutely. So we already worked working with Mike Brown's family on Hands Up. When we went into Hands Up, the NWCP and the Urban League helped finance the project that we did in November. We went into it for the election year. For one thing, too, you got to strategize when you do a film. So it has to make sense. It has to be an outlet. It has to have an audience. So we knew in tw 2019 that in 2020 would be the one of the most volatile years we would see. We didn't know it was going to be a pandemic. So this year is really crazy. We didn't know this election year is going to be crazier than we expected. But we knew there were stories that needed to be told. And um, for Hands Up, we start in 1855. We start during slave time. And we bring you up to 2020. And what inspired it was the Mike Brown story. Um, but we, tr we switched it in the middle. We ins Mike Brown inspired it. But then also, we have a lead that's only 11 years old. Uh, so we also were inspired by the young men or young boys who've been gunned down for, say, in Chicago for just holding a, a water pistol, and it was gunned down. So we started mixing different stories. We have them dressed like Trayvon Martin in Hands Up. So it just started to turn into something else where we're now representing all Black men and what's happening. And who knew, would have known, now we have another very famous case that story needs to be told. So absolutely, I work with any family. Yes. So when is that releasing or? Well, initially we were going to showcase it at Cannes Film Festival and then that got uh, pushed because of the pandemic. So now we got to re we got to pivot. Now we got to figure out how we're going to do this. If we're just going to go on a platform and just release it because it's definitely in line with the election year. We're telling yeah. stories to let people know that nothing has changed since the 1800s. Wake up. I don't care what you think it is. It's the same. Our cast members play dual roles. So if they were a slave in 1855. There's something that we can recognize in 2020, and we show there's no change. So, oh, for example, wow. our plantation owner in 1855 is the chief of police in 2020. So it's very yeah. good, very clever. I directed it. We shot it on an actual plantation. We have a big story about that. In 2019, uh, the state of Georgia fought us to shoot this film. We had to get, that's why we had to get the NWCP involved, wow. Urban League. Uh, people read the script and was like, oh no, we're not shooting that. We're not showing that story. These are real stories. So we finally got it done uh, with the help of- What do you feel about people. that? Like how, mm -hmm. how are they trying to take away our voice to mm -hmm. speak on our reality? Like it happened to us and somebody you know from another race did it but they don't want us to speak on it you know yeah, like it's it's complex. So, it's complex because yeah. People say things have changed, but then when you want to tell these stories, they haven't changed. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, when I first was looking for locations to shoot in Georgia, the script kind of got out a little bit and people thought I was a part of Black Lives Matter and I wasn't. But what if I was? It doesn't matter. It still is a story to be told. So people will turn it around that you're trying to do radical storytelling and that's what they try to stop. They, they claim they don't want you to incite anything. And that's not at all what we were, we were attempting to do. And that's not what the story does. Um, well, but do you have to fight. Yeah, do you feel like sometimes, you know, the sad stories, because it can kind of take a toll on me to watch a certain movie. Like, I have to really get in the mindset to, like, okay, <laughs> let me watch The Help, or let me watch 12 Years right. Play. Like, I can't, like, just turn it on and say, okay, let's watch a movie tonight. So, do... <sighs> Do you feel like the, the happy, positive stories are just as important as the history and 
as far as the history goes, when is it too, I guess, um, I guess too graphic? Yeah, I think both, both, you need balance, you need positive and you need negative, right? So I think both are needed. I think historically we have to tell these stories because that's the only way the new generation is going to know them, right? Yes. Um, and I think we need to have some happy stories because we can't sit in a place of depression because that's what's happening. Even right now, people are really depressed right now. So you have to be careful when you release these stories because sometimes it's too much. Uh, but also people are tired of resting. People are tired of being happy for the wrong reasons. People are tired of sitting. So I never chose a political piece because I know career-wise it could hurt you. Sometimes when you choose a political piece, people then don't want to be associated with you for whatever reason. But I knew at this point in my career, after doing 30-some movies, you're not going to affect my career by me telling a political piece. Right. Right. So, And this movie, you will, have to, you will have to get ready for. We have some hard scenes, like 12 Years as a Slave. We got those same hard scenes in this film. Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, I feel like... Like you said, we have to definitely had a balance and we definitely need the stories, but it can be a bit much. I have to really mm -hmm. get into my mind, like, okay, okay. don't be angry after <laughs> watching this movie. <laughs> yeah, our movie, you're going to be angry at, at the shore. You know, we ended it in a way on purpose to incite people to think and also to ask tough questions. And then us having a young little boy as the lead and he's about to go through some stuff, that's going to tear anybody's heart, right? And we chose that strategically. We want to tell it from the, the from the eyes of a young boy. What is he seeing about this world? Yeah, yeah, that's very that's very important. But you've also been working on some of the more lighthearted stuff. That Absolutely, we're talking about yes. with Ray J. Now, yes. that, is that out or is it coming? That is out. out. Okay, it's called Pump P U M P. And you can see it on urbanflixtv.com. It came out May 1st. It stars Ray J, uh, Michael J. White, Jennifer Freeman, McKinnon. Is it a movie Freeman. or a series? It's a TV series. Okay. Yep, it's a TV show. And urbanflixtv.com is a new platform geared to telling diverse stories. Okay. All right. So how did you link up with them? And how are they helping you um, with your content? Yeah, so I haven't, this is, I was brought on. This is a case where it wasn't my story. So Corey Grant, who was the creator, uh, showrunner, producer, writer, director, he brought me on. And this is not my story. He already had the story co-created okay. with Lynette Tichelle. And they asked me, did I want to come on board? So uh, that's how I was blessed to get this job opportunity. It's a fun comedy. It has a heart. You know, we're, we're following Misfits at a gym, but there is a heart in the story. So it's not just ha, 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 ha. <laughs> okay all right so um what do you i was i was listening to something you were saying about creatives don't really understand the business of mm -hmm. this business so tell me what you think as far as like creatives go like even behind the scenes or mm -hmm. in front of the camera what they need to know going into show business because it's a yeah. business right yeah, I started Backstage Pass to the movie industry. That's my school. I started two years ago. And the reason why is because most people want to be in the business and don't have a clue of how the business works, right? It's like you wanted to be a surgeon and you never went to medical school. You need to understand how this business works. Think about particularly how many people of color who have died. Let's say Red Fox. Let's say Sammy Davis Jr. with not a dime in their pocket. And people are like, why? How? Well, they didn't know the business. This is a mm -hmm. business. You can sing, act, dance for the camera, everything you want to do. Understand somebody's trying to profit off of you. Don't be mad they're trying to profit off of you. It's a business. Now you need to understand how to take your skill set and make it a business. You are a brand, you are McDonald's, you are IBM, you're Papa John's. Now yes. if you want to profit off of my skills, you need to pay me and this is how you do it. So tell me um, a little more about that program because yes. uh, you said you've been doing it for two years. How many? Mm -hmm students or people have you had go through the program and like what is the end goal like are they going to end up working for you if it works out or like what's their yeah. the backstage point? pass just joined yeah backstage pass in the movie industry is an online platform you can take it from wherever you are we have producers boot camp actors boot camp we do monthly group coaching we just have richard t jones who's an actor last week 
We just had Tamara Goins, who's one of the few African-American women partner agents. We do monthly coaching. Anybody can join. You do not have to work for me. I do take a lot of my students who do work for me, but I only have a few students in LA. I've coached hundreds of students. The youngest uh, actress on Mixish, Michael Michelle, was one of my students. It doesn't matter the age. When I started with her, she was five. Now she's eight. Um, I have big brand ambassadors who I coach. So we coach anybody. Our, my job there is just to tell you the game and show you the game. Okay. And then you go out there and you get the money. Hey, y'all need, need to check this out. <laughs> yes. Tell them what to check it. What is yes, it? backstage pass. Kristen, if you're watching, if you can put it in the chat. Um, yes. You guys look at my programs. I'm here to teach you how to make money, okay? Hello. Money is your craft. Understand now, is that slowing down because of the pandemic? Like, how is this affecting business? I know the entertainment business. Are we going to be up and running soon? Like, what is happening? No. Right now, we're probably not. You know, we had a meeting this morning, some people, the people I work with, and we're like, we are thinking June. They were like, mm, maybe July, because right now the insurance companies are not willing to insure certain things because if you get sick on a set, they're like, I have nothing to do with it. That's on you. And I don't want to be sued if somebody gets sick on my set. So what I've been teaching my students, we have an ebook class. Part two is tomorrow night. They're all writing books. They're becoming authors. We're te I'm teaching them seven ways to make money through affiliate marketing, through brand ambassador. It's like, look, y'all got to understand something. People are making money with the cell phone right here. Mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so I have to teach you how to make this money because what the what this pandemic has shown us, the acting business can stop like. Yes. Now let, let's get real. Let me get real with you now. There's a lot of people who are famous, you think have a lot of money, who right now are struggling. Wow, I was just seeing um, some uh, magazines in the store. They were saying, "Oh, this celebrity's trying to sell their house. Oh, this celebrity." Yes trying to figure it out and it's like yes. you're staying in this super huge mansion and you don't have your next role it's yeah. real let me tell you the streets is real right now so what i did i pivoted immediately the end of march i told my students up front because we meet every other week on zoom We've been doing Zoom for two years. Y'all just got to Zoom. We've been on Zoom, right? So every two me, weeks, yeah, we were already on Zoom. So the end of March, I said, look, we're not going to do the typical guest speakers anymore. We're going to do some of them, but I need you to teach you skill sets that survive a pandemic. Because whether or not you're acting, writing, producing, or directing, I have two of my students on now, they're directors, you're going to learn how to make money. You're going to have other skills. Being an author, you can get paid all day. Teach somebody how to cook. Teach somebody how to sew. Yeah. We need somebody. You need seven streams of revenue. Now, Real talk. That's what I really wanted to get into, like, as mm -hmm. far as your upbringing and your, like, the other jobs that you had, just as far as, like, giving you that hustle. Like, do you feel like it's just in p people or do you have to be raised that way or you, or you just have something in you that's like, I want, like you said, more for myself? I think it is really, it starts from somewhere. I don't know if I just had it, but I think what happens is you start going through traumatic experiences or you start feeling overlooked, you get it. I've worked with people who are just satisfied with the nine to five. They worked with me and was like, oh no, I really can get more. Yeah, and you deserve more. And I think what happens is when you're, depends on your circle. When you're around crabs, you're going to be a crab. When you're around kings and queens, you're going to elevate. I'm really funny on that. Like all my students, we travel together. We went to Sundance Film Festival. That's in Park City, Utah in January. I had them around very famous and wealthy people because I want them to be comfortable with the environment so they understand they deserve to be in that environment. So it starts here. It's yeah. a mindset. And once you get it, nobody has to tell you you deserve a five-star restaurant because you already expect it. And yeah. I always take them out to a five-star restaurant. We went to American Black Film Festival last year in Miami. They came to Atlanta when I shot the film. I always take them to something fancy. I make them get dressed up because I want them to understand your expectations are what you expect. That's why I got a party, girl. Let's go. Yes. <laughs> when we can go outside again. <laughs> yes, that's what it is. So for me, I was doing, at one point, like when I was between 18 and 22, BS jobs. And I was like, I deserve more than this. This is ridiculous. Like, this is not me. And what happened, I, I was always the person I hung out with somebody older. I don't know if you were like that. I always wanted to be older than I was. 
even in high school, I didn't want to hang out with nobody in high school. I was hanging out with people in college. But what that did was that made me think, I want more, I want more. You know, I had a car at 16, and I didn't even have a license. I just had a driver's permit. And they were like, why do you want a car? And I'm from New Jersey, part of Jersey, I'm from people don't have sometimes cars because we really work in New York. And they're like, why do you need a car? I said, because I want to go somewhere. So yeah. I always <laughs> was around people who had stuff. And that might have come with because I was raised at first with nothing. And sometimes when you have nothing, again, the only place you can go is up. And you're like, I want to have something. Yeah. So, okay. So you basically went to school. Mm -hmm. You have a few degrees. Yes. You have a law degree. You have two yes. other degrees, a master's. And a bachelor's, yeah. And a bachelor's, of mm -hmm. course. So you... Do you feel like, because um, you're doing something totally different, do you feel like that was necessary to have that foundation? Or were you kind of trying to figure things out and change your mind? Like, what was... I the, think I knew at one point, and I was influenced by my uncle who was an attorney, I knew I needed more skill sets. I was working at one point in a record company. I could go nowhere. I was just going to be a runner, or, um, an assistant, and just marketing somebody else's record. I was like, there's no way. And at the time in the 90s, there was really nobody who looked like me. It was male dominated completely. And um, I was blessed with Sylvia Rome, Suzanne DePass, other people like that, who was like, you need to go back to school. That's the only way you're gonna get into a new job. And so when I went back, it was strategic. I'm, I'm always strategic. So when I went back for my master's, I said, okay, maybe I can get a better job, get a little bit more money. Then I went to law school, never to really be a lawyer at, initially. It was really just to have it on my resume. Mm. Because at the time, everybody who was an executive when I was in the music industry, they had a higher education degree. And then I also wanted to be knowledgeable. So that's really why I started getting the education. And I'm big on education because what it does, it gives you discipline. And then I started becoming structured. Then again, what? You're around different types of what? People. Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden you're seeing a whole nother lifestyle another yeah. world and then i knew too when i used to work at the law firms i was the only a person of color not woman or man i was the only person i was like wait a minute wait a minute my grind gotta be 10 times stronger than i thought because yeah. we need more people up here out of a hundred person law firm you only got one mm -mm. yeah That's so do you feel like it's important because i heard you mention like the resume you wanted your resume to be on point and to have those mm -hmm. accolades on there but it's also about like who you know, because I yeah. feel like a lot of people like Trump get into position yeah. and they don't even qualify. Absolutely. They don't qualify. <laughs> just... Absolutely. You're absolutely right. And so what happens with the mixture of the resume and people you know, I can put you in position. You still got to be qualified somewhat. And I say somewhat, okay? Because it's illusion. Everything's an illusion. Look, yeah. if your resume is a certain way, nobody can deny you the position, even if you don't really have the skill sets to do the job. I hire people all the time. They don't know what they're doing, but I like them. They're cool, yeah. you know? Yeah. I can train them, and then at least they got their bachelor's or something. I can be like, okay, I just didn't just give them the job. They did go to school and have some training. Yeah. So it's like a combination of two. And, I, and, I'm, and I'm older, so I'm in my 40s. And in the 90s, you had to have some combination of the two. People couldn't just put you on completely without yeah. some type of validation. Now it's a little different. You can you can get put on a lot more. Yeah, I just I feel like a lot of things are way more fast paced now just due to social media and if you have a lot of followers and if you you know, it's just a lot of superficial things that mm -hmm. can happen. But what do you feel like are some of like the business red flags or like a red flag when you are dealing with someone and you you kind of are like turned off about doing business with them. Like you, you just decide in that meeting or whatever encounter you guys have that you're, you know, you're good on that. Yeah, I feel time. like I feel like in business a lot of times, you know, everybody's like, oh, let's collaborate, let's work together. Everybody can't work together. Right. No, everybody's not going to work with you, and you're not going to want to work with everybody. It happens all the time. Let me say, at least one, every project I'm on, there's at least one person. I'm like, I'm good on them. And, and, and honestly, there's nothing wrong with that. It takes a while to find your squad. You know, you need people who are going to ride or die with you, people that are going to be in the trenches with you. It's not going to be all good. 
So if somebody's in your tribe and they're complaining all the time and when it's not good, they want to quit, let them quit. I hate people every day come to work and say, I want to quit. I, I'm, I'm the one that says, please quit, please go. Because you obviously don't want to be here. Yeah, you don't want to be here. Like nobody yeah. wants to be around that. If you think this is going to be glamorous or it's going to come so easy, this entertainment is the wrong industry for you. This is a lot of tears. want to go on the red carpet and go to the parties, honey. Girl, the red carpet only has like happens like once a year maybe. Okay? That's when a project comes out. So if you're looking for the red carpet, you might as well go on other people's red carpets. Because it's not going to happen here like that. You know, this is work. You know, we work 12 to 15 hours a day when we're shooting a project. So a lot of people, they'll complain by day two. You know it's not going to work. Because I, I hate people complaining. I hate complainers. I do. Complaining is, is a red flag, y'all. Yes. It you is. Nobody cares. And nobody cares. That's the yeah. hard part. Nobody cares. Right. You want me to answer this question, I think? Um, I yeah, it says fly jet king he wants to audition for one of your projects so how can he do that yes so the best way to audition is when we have projects they go out on something called actors access through breakdowns you'll see our names sometimes i'll post it in the stories right before i have a project and then i'll let you know who to submit your resume uh and your headshot to and that's normally going to be a casting director and then when you submit through that process we're going to look and see if you're ready to go. Make sure you have a demo reel. Make sure you know how to self-tape, because now this is the world of self-taping, where you can do it at home on your leisure. And a lot of times, I always look at brand new actors. I love untapped talent. I love it. They're, they're hungry. They're not complainers. They're just happy to be there. Right. And, and the beauty comes out of them with that. Right. So was... Uh... Anything, I mean, because we are kind of on a standstill, so what's next for you? Just the rollout of your releases, or are you just going to just do everything digitally? What are your plans? Well, for the film side and TV, we're not sure what's going to happen. I just had Pump come out two weeks ago. I have a new TV show, Laugh Tonight with Damon Williams, that comes out in a week and a half. So I'll be preparing to release something else. And then in the, in the meantime, I'm focusing on training students to be prepared because when we do go back to business, it's going to be so many more projects available. Look, everybody's watched all of Netflix, right? Mm -hmm. People are over it. Okay, there's no content, no new right. content. So right. there's going to be so many more opportunities, more than ever. Oh, well, let me get ready. Do I need to send you a script? Oh, my earring fell out. Hold on. <laughs> do I need to send you a script? What I need? What I need? We to will do? connect. We will connect. <laughs> We're already connected. Kirby will connect us. Yeah. But this, people are looking for scripts. So for the writers out there, people are looking for you right now because once they figure out how to shoot projects after this, not after, but through this pandemic, they need new content. People have watched all of Amazon, Hulu, Netflix. There's nothing new on NBC, ABC, Fox, CBS. There's nothing new. Yeah. We're, we're, we're in some untapped waters right now. This is crazy. So <laughs> tell me about how... Have you ever had to adapt to something so huge in business? I know this is unheard of. This has never happened before. But anything else kind of like knock you off your feet in business where you had to recover and figure it out? Absolutely. All the time. You know, you can start a project and you're ready to go and then lose the financing. And now you got to tell all these people that you hired, I, we can't continue. And that happens a lot, more than what people realize. Uh, you can be at a job. I've been let go at a job. When I was really uh, getting my feet in producing in 2011 and 12, I was still working at a law firm. People just didn't know because I couldn't get rid of the nine to five check. It was a hold over me, getting that check, you know, that comfortability. So I'm up here working there, doing movies on a weekend, doing movies at night, taking off, you know, taking two weeks off, unpaid. And the firm was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're taking two weeks off and you don't care about getting paid? Oh, something's up. And I remember the day I got laid off, I said, I'll never go back for a nine to five. That was a wake up call. And it, sh it shook me because I was like, where's my money going to come from? You got to understand something. When you're comfortable with that nine to five check, it is devastating to lose it. Yeah. Shout it, out to the, to the writers in the house. Oh, awesome. Thank you. Maya and Jay, uh, Thea, casting director in the house. We got awesome. the industries up in here. Awesome. Listen to these gems. Welcome. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. We have to be able to adapt and bounce back from 
the unknown. Cause that, it's hard though. I'm not gonna lie because I was somebody who was used to a nine to five check, yeah. and everybody can tell you to work for yourself. It sounds good until you're out of work. <laughs> you have so, no help. So tell me about that transition because. I kind of feel like a lot of times it's forced on us, like, oh, we've been let go. Mm -hmm. Now we're free to do whatever our dream desire. But for those people who are afraid to walk away and, you know, they have something on their heart, what do you, what advice do you have for them? Yeah, I'm going to be honest. I was forced at some point, too. It wasn't, it wasn't a choice. I was laid off because I was busy doing other things. And I would tell people, save your money. You have to have a nest egg before you walk away from your job. I was lucky that they gave me a severance package. So I was able to live off of that for six months. And I was able to live off of unemployment for another six to get on my own feet. But the biggest thing I see is people don't have a nest egg. You have to prepare to work for yourself. And you got to be prepared to work all day and night and maybe not see a check for a year. So it's mental. And it's no joke. And for me, I won't go back into a nine to five because it wasn't fair to the nine to five to really be working on my passion. It wasn't fair to both yeah. parties. So you said they they felt like you were too busy for them, so they let you go? Oh, absolutely. They felt like I didn't want to be there, and I didn't. If you're taking weeks off for vacation, and they know, they, you know, at the time, social media in 2011, 12 wasn't like this, but they still knew I was doing projects. You know, people talk at any job. Um, I was inviting people. I, was doing, I do a lot of live comedy shows. And at the time, Tony Rock and I had a show that I created called the Comedy Underground Series. And they, I was inviting them to the show. So, you know, they come to my live shows. They're like, oh, she don't want to be here. People know where you want to be. Because you barely come into work. I used to come to the law firm office and close the door and never open it until 7 o'clock at night. So what am I doing behind the door? Mm -hmm. <laughs> What's yeah. That? Yeah. Like, what's going on here? You don't want to yeah. be here. Yeah. We're helping you by letting you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. Sometimes, Bro, <laughs> you know, it can be something devastating, like, oh my God, my, my steady check, but it got you into your passion. And now you did. Happy, right? Yes. And it's, it's a process. It. My parents were very worried. You know, as we all know, our parents want us to be uh, successful, comfortable, secure. They want us to have health insurance. You know, I went two years with no health insurance. Well, thank God nothing happened. It's, it's a scary moment. And I had no nest egg because when you have a nine to five, you don't save. Let's just keep it real. You know, every two weeks, that check is coming. When you work for yourself, you don't know when it's coming. So I got into real estate heavily. And in fact, I'm going to be teaching my students about real estate in June or July. And thank God I had real estate because no matter what, that's constant. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, so who are some of the people that you've gotten advice from or that mm -hmm. has helped you or who you look up to? Oh, there's so many people. Uh, you know, a lot of people don't know. Ava DuVernay used to be a publicist. And that's why I say you always need to research people's journey because you have no idea. So she used to be my publicist. What? And so, <laughs> yeah, so back in like 05, 06, I used to work uh, with one of my mentors who put me in the game um, over at Showtime. And she was the publicist. And I remember she was chasing her dream back then and giving a lot of advice about chasing the dream. And so I, I didn't really understand. Sometimes you don't understand the advice when you get it. It's just advice, right? Uh, so she's one that's given a lot of advice. Uh, I have a lot of mentors who are producers that have given a lot of advice to me. I've had studio executives who have given advice as well. But I think at the end of the day, the, the most sound advice has been my mother, who's not in the business. Because at the end of the day, you're, if somebody really loves you, they're going to keep it real with you, right? Yes. So and they don't need to be in your business, your industry, to tell you the real about people. People are people. OK, so when I go and ask her certain questions, she keeps it real with me and she's not going to sugarcoat it. She's not there for the, the glitz and the glam. And so I still go to her for a lot of advice and she's not in, in the industry. But a lot of producers have put their hands on me. I've been involved with a lot of people. I used to be a talent manager for 12 years. So I've been involved with a lot of high profile talent and I've been able to watch their careers blossom and they poured back into me. And um, like we just had Richard T. Jones on last week. We've done two films together. He did a film with me in 2012. Then he did A Question of Faith, our most recent film. And he even poured in me last week about, hey, Angela, make sure, you know, don't worry about certain money. All money ain't good money. And don't worry about this. Don't worry about that. So they're always constantly pouring back. Kim Fields pours into me all the time. 
we got very close um, when we were touring the question of faith. So I have so many people who have reached back to say, we see you, yeah. we see you. Yeah. Make sure you stay focused. Well, I'm just wanted to know about how you were able to get into the industry because sometimes it can be hard. Was it someone that you knew or did you kind of work your way in because you were at the law firm and you were in school or was this something that you've been doing for years? Yes, I've been moonlighting for a long time. So when I lived in New York, um, I was working with Def Jam and they put me with Def Comedy Jam. And I didn't know anything about Def Comedy Jam, right? And so once I started working with comedians, I started managing them. And the first movie I ever touched a set on was called Pootie Tang. And we did that in 1999 <laughs> in New Jersey. That's where I'm from. And then I was working with the Chris Rock show. So when I moved to LA, I have a different story than most people. I was already in the entertainment business. So I have to preface that. So I was able to move here within three months, start working, not only as a talent manager, I was able to start getting jobs behind the scenes in business affairs. So I started with Soul Food because the person who was mentoring me when I first moved here, that's what show she was producing. So okay. my, my story is different. That's why I tell people you want to have a career at this because you, you don't know who's going to go to what company. So I started in New York, but came to LA and already knew people from New York. And then I just kind of, I'm, I'm good at meeting people. So I'm always networking, always networking, always trying to meet people. If people like you in entertainment, they'll hire you. Because I didn't go to film school. Yeah. I didn't yeah. go. I got in, though, as a lawyer by doing business affairs for a lot of films. So you, okay. you still have to have a doorway sometimes to okay. get in. So yeah. that was my doorway. People liked me. They gave me a shot. Then I learned producing on the job. Okay. So what are some of your goals now? Because it was like, okay, I really want to do this. Got my foot in the door. Do some out first film. I'm the first black woman to do this. What are some of the things that you aspire to to accomplish even further than what you've done already? Yeah, there's only about six or seven African-American women with production companies, and I'm one of them. And that's something that came out a couple of years ago, too, who have deals. Deals meaning, like, I had to output deal on Netflix. Deals meaning at companies, okay? There's only a few of us. And I'm still one that's still not mainstream. So my main focus right now is becoming an African-American woman production company with major deals at studios. That's the only way I'm going to break barriers. It's the only way I'm going to break the door down. I'm still in a male-dominated industry. People, got, they have to understand that. I'm, I'm usually the only female producer, or there might be one other female producer. I'm talking about maybe out of five or six. So my biggest barrier is just to be sure that we have representation of women in the industry behind the camera. We got plenty of that in front of the camera. Mm -hmm. So that's my short-term goal. My long-term goal is having a platform where I can create, have enough financing to create any content that comes through my doors, kind of like Tyler Perry has. That's the only way we're going to make a difference. If I always have to go and beg and borrow uh, money from people, I'm, I'm not in control. I'm always doing other people's content. Even if you think it's yours, it's really not yours. Because once the studio gets their hand on it, they're going to change it because they're financing it. The money, the power is in here. Tyler Perry is powerful because he doesn't need your money. He got it. There's, yeah. Nobody's going to come and tell him how to change his script. Nobody's going to tell him what to do at his studio. <laughs> That's the power. So we need more studio production companies of color with financing, backing it, and having deals. It's, it's, so, it's such a problem that uh, people don't really realize how less powerful we are. You see a lot of people of color in front of the camera, so you think there's a lot of power there? There's not. Yeah. yeah. It's an so, illusion. Yeah, that's, that's very true. Because I've been on set and I've been the only person mm -hmm. all of color, front, back. It doesn't <laughs> matter. I'm the only person there. I'm like, where we at? <laughs> you know? It's like, it's I'm not a token it. one. Am I the token one? You know? It's still happening in 2020, y'all. And you live here. A yeah. So I don't shoot really that much here in L.A. I have oh. in the last nine months, which is rare for me. I usually shoot in the South, mostly in North Carolina or Georgia. Now it's mostly Georgia. Just go to another state. You're not going to see anybody. Wow. And everybody thinks Atlanta, because there are so many people of color that live there, that the crews are so diverse. Not at all. 
it was a struggle. I had on a question of faith had about a hundred crew members. It was a big film for me. We might have had ten people of color. So how does the hiring help ha happen? Is it like you hire a group and they bring their people, or exactly? So you will hire your key grip. He's going to bring the people under him. It usually starts with the DP. The DPs bring in his entire camera department. So if he works with these guys, you're not going to tell him who not to work with. Then a lot of times, the key uh, the DP is also recommending the gaffer. The gaffer a lot of times is recommending the key grip. It goes like a puzzle all together. So you might have your biggest department be all white male, not intentionally, but that's who they work with. That's their squad. So a lot of times, you'll see hair and makeup be diverse you'll see costumes sometimes be diverse so or maybe production design maybe but these are areas that you can see the diversity and that's it mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it's, 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 it's deep so tell me about uh being a producer if mm -hmm. you have developed the projects and you or you want to connect with a production company which you are yeah the best way to go about doing that because I know a lot of people, they're scared to tell their ideas that can get taken, especially right. if you're a little person and That's they're right. like, oh, well, nobody knows you. Bye. You know, like, what's the best way to protect yourself and to put yourself on? Yeah. So first thing is, I just did a legal class last month. You have to copyright your content. Go to copyright.gov. It's only $65. It was $45. It just went up in March to $65. I don't care if it's just lines. Copyright your idea. Anybody you send a log line to, synopsis, they can take it. Not because they're supposed to, but that's what people do. So you have to protect yourself. I tell people even on the phone, don't pitch me nothing you haven't copyrighted. Because I want to make sure that you're protecting yourself. This is the game, guys. So you want to copyright yeah. your ideas. Then you only want to send basically like your one sheet, which is a log line and synopsis if you're a writer. Don't send anything else. There's no need to send a script. They don't need to read a script until they've shown interest in the concept. So there's steps for this. And then you can reach out to people like me. People email me all the time with projects. You want me to answer that? Yes. There's a question so from says, the audience. Love Thea yes. says, who are her casting directors? Does she only film in L.A.? So, yeah, so Thea, so I rarely film in L.A. I, I have in the last nine months, which is very rare. But even within those nine months, I was in Atlanta. So uh, I prefer to shoot in Georgia. And so my main casting director for almost the last 15 years has been Lamise Williams. But recently it was Natasha Ward, Phaedra Harris, Kim Harden. So I've worked with a little bit of everybody. But my main casting director is Lamise, Lamise Williams out of New York. We don't even live in the same state. And she has cast most of my projects. But I've also worked with her sister, Natasha. Natasha Ward, who's a big casting director here in LA, who has done at least four of mine. I've worked with Kim Harden. I just worked with Phaedra Harris. So uh, the great thing is I don't I can work with a little bit of anybody, but I do have my staples. Awesome. And I think I have a couple more questions. All right, let's bring Rose, it. This is a comment. TT from the trap says he's ready to work. <laughs> just awesome. It. Let's see what you got. Are you showing your stuff on Instagram? Do you have your demo reel on your Instagram page? Do you have some clips, some snippets? Make sure you guys are showcasing right now your work on Instagram. People are scrolling there looking for talent. I know for a fact people have showcased talent in the last month and gotten deals because they were showing so much creativity. I need so to work harder, y'all. That's people are doing it. This Angela, let's talk yes, about it. and people are doing shows based off of what's happening right now on social media. YouTube can be your friend. YouTube can be your platform to get your own TV show. Yes. Right now. Yes. Um, Mayan yeah, Jack, as a writer, how do you get a meeting to pitch your ideas to a network? Okay, so for a network, a lot of times they want you to have representation. So a lot of times they won't just take you, and that's because there's so many lawsuits. They want you to have an agent or a lawyer who officially submits your project to them. Everybody's trying to protect themselves because what people don't realize, everybody comes up with the same idea. You might think your idea is so unique, you'll be surprised how many people have the same idea. So they want a chain of type, chain of record, 
of how did you come into this company. So say if you have an agent or lawyer, they set you up a meeting, it's called a general normally. And if it's not a general, then it's a pitch meeting. And then that's where you will pitch it. That's the easiest way because networks are really cautious about meeting anybody without representation. And that's only because people are constantly getting sued. Mm. Okay. That is another gem from Miss Angela. She is blessing us today. I appreciate you. No problem. Thank really? you for having me. I'm having a good time. Um, oh, we have another question. Black yeah, so yeah, I see that girl. one. So I'm always hiring crew positions. When I say always, always, I, I'm a producer that works with the below the line crew. So I'm always, all you have to do is just email me your resume and I'm at info, I N F O at MissAngelaWhite.com. I'm always hiring. And the reason why is because that's one place that I do can have some, some form of power and bring in diverse voices and diverse people. So how does it work with you um, doing it outside of, you know, in different areas, like mm -hmm. outside of LA, do people just have to get to their own, uh, you know, travel and they can take the job or how does it work? Yeah, so we usually bring the department heads. So the depart so just so you guys understand how it works for crew, we don't we don't hire everybody. We hire the head. So if we're hiring the head of hair and makeup and my head of hair and makeup is right here in LA, you will not be on that that crew in that department. It's called a department unless she hires you. So that's one thing that you have to understand. If you are, say, a great hairstylist, a great makeup artist, you need to know the heads of hair and makeup. If you're a great uh, composer or you know how to make a beat, you need to know music supervisors. So that's, again, understanding how this business works. Once you know the head, you move with the head. So when I hire the head of hair and makeup and I tell her I have a budget for eight stylists, I'm out of it at that point. She's bringing to me eight stylists. Whether I like them or not, they're in her department. If I have a problem with the stylist, I have a problem with her. She knows she's in charge of that department. So that's how it works. We bring the heads from LA. We put them up in hotels, just like we put ourselves up. And they work out, we tell them their budget. So say they have $30,000 for their department. Uh, we don't get into that. They then tell us what the rates they agreed on. They do the deals with their department. They just tell us the deals. We pay for the deals. We pay them. But again, that goes on within the department. Okay. Mm -hmm. So besides raising the money and, you know, having the money talk with people, what's the hardest thing about being a producer? What, what are some of the, I guess, the cons of the job? I think the main thing, people don't appreciate a producer. I think we're one of the most underappreciated positions because we're not creative. Like people think creative. Creative, they think the writer who wrote the script, the director who has to now be the visionary, um, the actors who have to tell the story through their performances. And they don't realize there's a machine behind all of this. You know, when you eat on set, there's a machine that did that. When you have a location, there's a machine. You know how you got to set? You know how everything's okay on set? You know, you have a permit. You know, you have people who are there to make sure you look good on camera. And I think producers are very much forgotten. We work the longest hours to be, we work the hardest. And not because to take away from any other position, we have to be there when the set opens up. We have to be there when the set closes. We got to work every day. Most people work five days a week. We have to work Saturdays and Sundays because we have to prepare for the next week or we're taking out fires from last week. So it's a very underappreciated position in my opinion. In my opinion, um, you work very long hours and that's a downside. So sometimes you feel you have no sleep. You're working 70 to 90 hours a week. And um, ultimately, you have to deal with a lot of personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, that's the hardest part for me. And I'm still struggling with that. That's the area I have to work on because you have to know how to work with everybody. You have to know how to speak to everybody. And everybody's so different. You know, everybody's in their feelings for different reasons. And you still have to be able to relate. And, and that's where I find it difficult, especially once I shoot in other places, not L.A. L.A. crew is L.A. crew. You can know an L.A. crew. I know that sounds strange, but L.A. crew has a certain language, a rhythm, a beat. You start going to the South, where I've been shooting, I don't know the South. I didn't grow up in the South. I, I'm not Southern. Nothing about me Southern. When they see me right away, they're like, oh, you must be from East Coast or West. Which, which coast are you from? I'm like, well, I'm from the East, but I live on the West. They know right away. I'm talking fast, you know, right away. They're like, slow down. <laughs> you know? 
<laughs> you have to know how to relate. And I know for me, I don't translate well in the South. I just don't. And so that's been a big struggle of how to relate to people who grew up differently than me. What I mean by grew up differently, I grew up around a lot of diverse cultures. I grew up around equality, at least seeing people in different industries. And I'll be honest with you, you go into the South, there are parts of the South that have never seen somebody like me. I remember I did a film called The Sincere in 2014, guys. It starred Isaiah Washington, Sally Richardson Whitfield. You can look it up. It was called The Sincere. It was just on, it was on Netflix for a couple of years. It's not on there now though. And um, great film, we shot it deep in North Carolina, right outside Wilmington. They had never met or seen an African-American who owned a production company. They've heard of Tyler Perry, they heard of Oprah, but they've never seen it. This is 2014. So I had to have a police escort me, and at the time my partner, who's an African-American male, to go in and out of these small towns because we could have been hurt. And I was like, wow, this is 2014. So I had to learn how to translate and relate to people who, one, were like, why are you in power? And two, who are you? Oh, yeah. yeah. So my son, Lisa Aaron. Because the crew Aaron is all Dillard. white men, right? They're like, yeah, listen to her. She painted Yeah, somebody's seen the movie. They just said, somebody Lisa good? Aaron. Like, yes. I know. They was giving you the side eye. Mm -hmm. Oh, more than side eye. We had to leave hotels one time because they refused to work with my partner, who was African American male at the time. Uh, refused. They, they were more comfortable with me being a woman. And so once we started experiencing that, uh, we only worked with people who were willing to work with us. And it was interesting for me to even work with people who looked like me because they've never seen it. So they didn't know how to work with me. They were just like, oh my God. Like, you're in charge for real? Like, who's behind the curtain? There has to be right. somebody behind the curtain. I'm like, it's me. <laughs> it's all it was shocking. And um, it, it taught me the country's not what you think it is. I tell people travel. You got to travel. OK, so you have a couple of dynamics. You are a black woman. Mm -hmm. You're in a position of power. Do you feel like there is that stigma of like, oh, she has to be nice because otherwise she's going to be known as a B-I-T-C-H mm -hmm. or you know, I have to present myself in this way because they're not going to take me seriously. Do you have those concerns? I did. So when I started doing full-time producing back in 11, when I was laid off from that law firm job, uh, I, I was very nervous. You know, my early career of producing when I was more in charge was very bad because I didn't understand really the world I was entering and how much... Uh, interaction I would have with people that are much older than me a lot of times didn't look like me now is a different game it's just business for me I don't really play games with people at all uh, uh before I was trying to be everybody's friend trying to be nice and then you get stomped on you literally you get stomped on uh and I had to learn that and I don't care if people call me the b word it's okay as long as you know you have to come here and do your job I, I don't have to no time for it you got to respect me just like you respect everybody else but do you think that can hinder you like on the come up or is it I don't know like the way that you get into the industry because I feel like it's different getting into the industry as an actor versus getting into the industry as a producer absolutely it's still hard absolutely it's definitely you know when you first start out you need to be respectful you need to be kind you need to be sweet once you start understanding your value and your worth you are going to shift because this industry is doggy dog I'm not going to sugarcoat it people will stomp on your head if you let them. And so you have to know the balance of, in your work, and I, I'm serious about that, especially it's called girls on the grind. As women, we have to know our worth. You don't want to end up on somebody's couch and then you wake up and say, how did I get here? You got here because you walked on into that house and got on that couch. So you have to know when to say no. I remember when I first moved to LA, I could have gone to a, and been involved in a lot of things, okay? Um, in early 2000s, it was on and cracking. Eddie Murphy was always at the comedy store. Arsenio Hall was still on. It was like, LA was off the hook in the early 2000s, okay? Totally different than now. We had a lot of African-American TV shows back then, if you remember. And I was always involved at a lot of events and parties because I managed comedians. And there were doors open to me, but there were things that came with those doors. Mm -hmm. So my career took a lot longer mm -hmm. than I know of other people because I wasn't willing to do certain things and participate. Hello. So, well, we only got 30 no. seconds left. I really mm -hmm. want to say thank you. You have You're dropped welcome. some gems. 
Uh, thank you guys so much for interacting with us with the questions. And um, we definitely want you to reach out to us. If you are a girl on the grind, you can reach thank out to you. me, email me, info at girlsonthegrind.com. I hope you enjoyed today's girl talk. And make sure you tune in each and every Thursday. Make sure you follow Miss Angela White, MS. Angela White and Girls on the Grind and stay in, in connection with us. And we're going to be out of here. And Miss Angela, I will be in touch with